The scheme highlighted in this video is implemented through three main steps. But make no mistake, despite the local appearance, this is an attack by foreign interests and foreign investors, which has been formulated or, or uh, proved in previous videos. And these agents carrying out this attack on U.S. soil, as this primarily has to go with the United States, but is happening across the globe, this is being done by local agents on behalf of foreign interests. Now the first element which will be required and is currently being mobilized will be roadblocks. Now these roadblocks will be checkpoints that will be done under the guise of disaster uh, leading disaster response basically by certain local outfits, but they will be armed They'll have to be right and these checkpoints are going to relate to control of the response to a planned crisis essentially and this is what's behind current widespread road construction designed to establish the infrastructure as well as to get people used to the idea of being navigated in their traffic pattern. The next element that will be found with this operation has to do with the mobilization of foot soldiers, which requires a lot of housing construction. And that's what's behind the apparent so-called low income housing that's been going on in plan for leading the response to a crisis that was in fact planned and is being done to implement this attack. Of course, for these operations to be carried out, a large stockpile of ammunition and arms will be required in order to arm those minions that will be brought from and through the housing development process. The first element in the acquisition of arms can be found in a variety of different do evidentiary corroborating documentation, which has to do, of course, with forfeiture of arms and ammunition, of which they do des desire to take away the arms and ammunition from everyone, but specifically with the objective of stockpiling for arming their uh, their localized military, which won't be apparently a military and will be done under various operation operational programs. So this comes from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, one of the primary fronts for acquisition of firearms and ammunition and of course trafficking to all of their different elements. Here it states, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives gives notice that the property listed below was seized for federal forfeiture for violation of federal law. Laws and procedures applicable to the forfeiture process can be found at 19 U.S.C. sections 1602 through 1619, 18 U.S.C. sections 983, and 28 CFR parts 8 and 9. To file a petition for remission or mitigation, the government... They always act under the color of law, so-called phony government. May consider granting petitions, right? May consider for remission or mitigation, which pardons all or part of property from the forfeiture. You may file both a claim and a petition for remission or mitigation petition. If you file only a petition and no one else files a claim, your petition will be decided by the seizing agency and will not be heard in U.S. District Court. Hmm sounds quite similar to certain things that were going on during the colonial period and that's of course because we are in fact living in foreignly owned foreign owned colonies essentially even though they go by different names petitions do not require a cost bond to be submitted and therefore can be filed online the petition must include a description of your interest in the property supported by documentation include any facts you believe justify the return of the property and be signed under oath subject to the penalty of perjury or meet the requirements of an unsworn statement under penalty of perjury, blah, blah, blah. So there you go. 
If they take your stuff, then you have to ask them to give it back. If they decide not to, you essentially have no recourse. And considering the corrupt nature, fraudulent nature of the courts that we have today, even if you did file a suit in those courts, it would never be ruled in your favor because they're set up all for the purposes of a foreign operation to establish overt domination. All will be underdone under the guise of a crisis, as is normally the procedure in these types of activities. Next, we come to the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Explosives ATF document by the Department of Justice. Here it states the mission. The ATF protects communities from violent criminals. Criminal organizations' illegal use, that means, of course, not listed on paper, illegal being reduced to writing, and trafficking of firearms, which, of course, is what they do, but they do it, quote-unquote, legally. Illegal use and storage of explosives, acts of arson and bombings, and acts of terrorism. So here's their legitimate cover for, possibly speaking, one of the most criminal operations that could ever be done, but that's not according to their phony regulations and codes from the International Code Council, uh, Switzerland, UN, UN, etc. The ATF partners with communities, industries, law enforcement, and public safety agencies to safeguard the public through information sharing, training, research, and application of technology. Where you get your censorship and all that nonsense, too. Organization, the ATF's director is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The ATF operates 25 domestic field divisions and maintains a presence of 12 international offices in eight countries. And this, the rest of this is, is not nonsense. Now, it should be known that the ATF is simply a cover and is just a letterhead or a rubber stamp that is put on documents when they want to look official. But most of this stuff is carried, about, carried out by locals, especially attorneys who will file paperwork uh, using whichever organization they need, whichever title they need to get the job done. Now, reading further... Under FY 2025 strategy, the ATF operates a variety of programs to address firearms, violence, arson, and explosive-related crime. The ATF's illegal firearms trafficking enforcement efforts, <laughs> that could be worded in a better way, focus on reducing violent crime by stemming the flow of firearms to violent criminals. And of course, they decide what a violent criminal like with the red flag laws and the extreme risk order protection program, which isn't exactly, it is applicable, but it's not completely important to this video and the operations being done, just a component. In addition, the ATF partners, federal, state, local law enforcement agencies target violent offenders and remove them from America's streets. So there you go. They, when they say partner, what they really mean is that those are the actual operational individuals that carry it out. In line with Attorney General's comprehensive strategy, strategy for reducing violent crime, CRSBC, the ATF frontline business model ensures bureau resources are directed to the most serious offenses and most dangerous criminals. Business model. The external component of frontline is the Violent Crime Reduction Partnership and collaboration between ATF and the federal, state, and local partners to effectively prioritize and maximize impact on violent crime. That, of course, means like I said before, removal of weapons through forfeitures. And we'll look at, at the stockpiling component later. The ATF strategy includes comprehensive intelligence-driven assessments in each ATF field divisions that define the significant violent crime problems within its area of responsibility and propose a plan of action to mitigate or eliminate those threats. The consolidated assessments define national priorities and guide resource decisions. Blah, blah, blah. This is all just um, doublespeak, essentially. Combating gun violence, additional funding and positions will allow, allow the ATF to address the alarming surge in firearm violence in American communities. This enhancement is necessary for the ATF to meet the goals of the administration department to enhance enforcement efforts focused on firearms trafficking. Their enforcement efforts are focused on firearms trafficking. What exactly does that mean? Well, it's not what you think it means. It means their enforcement efforts are focused on their ability to traffic firearms which had, requires, of course, the forfeiture of those firearms that they're going to then turn on the populace and obviously derive from the populace. 
and to increase the support of the ATF provides to local, state, territorial, and tribal law enforcement in the investigation of violent firearm offenses because firearm trafficking networks are often trans involve transport of firearms across jurisdictional, state, and national boundaries. The ATF's federal statutory authorities and expertise are essential to effective investigation, disruption, and prosecution. Blah, blah, blah. And naturally, the forfeiture or seizure is the primary component here. And we are very well aware the ATF is, in fact, a trafficking organization acting under the color of law considering Operation Fast and Furious. And I'm sure there's many other components that we're not aware of considering the other documents we'll be looking at. So we have the same stuff te uh, tends to be repeated across here. We'll move on to the next component. So in the same document, we have National Service Center expansion, 43.9 million and 25 positions. Additional funding and positions will expand and improve the ATF facility in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Who knows if that's true or if that's just a red herring to distract you. The current facility is critically insufficient with regards to both the building and parking capacity as well as specialized vault and evidence storage of firearms as the ATF's National Services Center, NSC. Program enhancement is critical as the facility has surpassed the maximum capacity of building space and temporary measures allowing for continued operations are not sustainable in the future. Yes, that of course tells you they do in fact want to have quote-unquote, sustainable operations in the future, and that tells you what sustainability really means when all of these corporations and other bogus entities all working together and running a front, they all talk about sustainability. This overcapacity poses a significant risk to the ATF's ability to execute both its core public safety function, supporting state and local law enforcement fighting gun crime, and for the regulatory mission at the NSC, there are no current services for this initiative. Fighting gun crime. That's one of their tag words there. Double speak, as it were. Forensic services, gun, um, crime gun intelligence. That's a pretty weird way that's worded. 13.1 million and 30 positions. Additional funding and positions will allow the ATF to fund the initial development of high throughput. Wow, that's a weird word, rapid processing unit for analysis of DNA and fired cartridge cases, FCCs, and funding for DNA expansion, which will link gun crime to the same individual even when different firearms are used. So they're going to link gun crimes to the same individual. Hmm. What could that mean? Value of adding DNA technology to ATF's arsenal of tool tools is massive. Yeah, it's a, it's a phrase that means virtually nothing. Just as N NIBIN provides a kind of fingerprint to a gun, being able to also detect a fingerprint of the shooter from a casing extracted from that gun will revolutionize the way ATF conducts its investigations. Of course, they make, can make all this crap up and you can't really do anything about it, right? Body-worn cameras, additional funding positions will allow the ATF to provide digital case management software and video cloud storage for video from the BWCs of both ATF special agents and federally deputized TFOs under the BWC requirements set forth by the department's BWC call policy. I expect those so-called federally deputized TFOs will be the main component that one might see throughout this operation, the ones actually going and doing the seizures. So here in the U.S. Code, which is constantly cited and is intellectual property and international code counts along with all the rest of the code, we will get in chapter 44 of 18 U.S.C. firearms our first example of their intent to for, uh, seize and dispose. It's not, they're not really disposing of it in the same way that we would think firearms. Here it states any firearm or ammunition involved or used in any knowing violation of subsection blah 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 or knowing importation or bringing into the United States or any possession thereof any firearm or ammunition blah 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 or knowing knowing violation of section blah 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 or willful violation of any other provision of this chapter or any rule or regulation promulgated there under. Right, notice that part. Any rule or regulation promulgated there under. That leaves it very wide open for basically anything they want, any pretext to seize armament. 
or any violation of any criminal law of the United States or any firearm or ammunition intended to be used in the offense referred to in paragraph 3 of this subsection, right? Any violation of any other criminal law. Of course, their laws are criminal according to the Constitution, but they considered the Constitution to be criminal as well and have revised it to be more palatable for their operations. So, where such intent is demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence, shall be subject to seizure and forfeiture. And all provisions of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 relating to the seizure, forfeiture, and disposition of firearms. So there we've got the Internal Revenue Code, which has to do with their bogus taxes, as a pretext to seize, forfeit, and dispose firearms. What exactly does disposition really mean? In a different chapter and section of the U.S. Code, we will get an understanding of what they mean by disposition. 26 U.S.C., or Title 26, of the Internal Revenue Code, Subtitle E, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Certain Other Excise Taxes. Chapter 53, Machine Guns, Destructive Devices, and Certain Other Firearms. Here, under forfeitures, it states laws applicable. Any firearm involved in any violation of the provisions of this chapter shall be subject to seizure and forfeiture. And, as, as except as provided in subsection B, all the provisions of internal revenue laws relating to searches, seizures, and forfeitures of unstamped articles are extended to and made to apply to the articles taxed under this chapter and the persons to whom this chapter applies. Now, that stamp is quite similar to the Stamp Act that was such a huge deal in the colonial period of the Americas, in which we have stamps today that we're forced to use to make anything official and we're forced to pay for those stamps in order to get anything done officially or legitimately according to them. That is the same thing that they did with the Stamp Act essentially in the colonial period except that specifically had to do with ships. People had to purchase from them their specific stamps sent from overseas foreign interests in order to legitimize the bills of lading for ships. And if they didn't have that stamp then the ship would immediately be seized same scheme but perpetuated across a much larger scale and in relation to a much larger number of industries and other well they should be constitutionally protected activities but they're not because the Constitution is not actually enforced these foreign codes are here we have disposal in the case of the forfeiture of any firearm by reason of a violation of this chapter no notice public sale shall be required. doesn't mean you can't sell it at, um, at a public sale. It's just not required to have a notice of it. No such firearm shall be sold at public sale. Well, there's the prohibition on it, even though they don't really follow their prohibitions if, if they, because their laws apply to us, basically not to them. If such firearm is forfeited for violation of this chapter and there is no remission or mitigation of forfeiture thereof, it shall be delivered by the Secretary to the Administrator of General Services. And here we get our trafficking, or in this case would be firearm laundering, moving it from one location to another so it basically gets lost in a convoluted and endless maze of systems in which you have no recourse. General Services Administration, who may order such firearm destroyed or may sell it to any state, or possession or political subdivision thereof. Political subdivision is probably the more important section for this video. Or at the request of the secretary may authorize its retention. Now here you go with the stockpile. Its retention for official use of the treasury department or may transfer it without charge to an executive department or independent establishment of the government for use by it. That is their purpose behind the forfeiture of arms, is to then turn those arms that they seized back on the populace that they seized those arms from. This is textbook for an adversarial operation of warfare. And all these entities that are involved in this, not only are they engaged in treason, they are enemy combatants, regardless of whether they carry guns or not. They are carrying out operations warfare. Here on the website for FEMA, it gives a short definition of what a political subdivision is. 
states a unit of government created by and under the authority of a higher level of government. If a state divides itself up into counties, the counties are political subdivisions of the state. If those counties divide themselves up, up into county subdivisions, the county subdivisions are political subdivisions of the counties, which are in turn political subdivisions of the state. In BCAT usage, political subdivision typically refers to any type of jurisdiction within a state or territory, but not including the state or territory itself. In the Ohio Revised Code, General Provisions, Chapter 9, Miscellaneous, it states as used in the section, one political subdivision means any body corporate and politic, except a municipal corporation that has adopted a charter under Section 7 of Article uh, 18. Ohio Constitution, except the county that has adopted charter under Sections 3 and 4 of Article 10, Ohio Constitution, to which both of the following apply. That's, of course, a very different definition of political subdivision from the one we just read. A. It is responsible for governmental activities only in geographic areas smaller than the state. It is subject to the sovereign immunity of the state. Don't you love that? Sovereign immunity. They're sovereign. Hmm. How do they declare, declare themselves a sovereign and gain sovereign immunity? They are not legitimate government. They are foreign-owned corporations. Cigarettes and tobacco product have the same meanings as blah, blah, blah. Transaction has the same meaning. Campaign committee, campaign fund, candidate, legislative campaign fund, political action committee, blah, 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 blah. Have the same meaning. B, except as otherwise provided in Division C of this section, the governing body of a political subdivision may use public funds to publish and distribute newsletters or use any other means to communicate information about the plans, policies, and operations of the political subdivision to members of the public within the political subdivision and to other persons who may be affected by the political subdivision. C, except as otherwise provided, and blah, 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 the, no governing body of a political subdivision shall use public funds to do any of the following. One... This is weird, it goes 1AB. Publish, distribute, or otherwise communicate information that does any of the following. A contains defamatory, libelous, or obscene mat matter. Oh, they do that. Promotes alcoholic beverage, cigarettes, or other tobacco products, or any illegal product, service, or activity. And of course, they do that as well. Promotes illegal discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, disability, age, or ancestry. Of course, that means they can, in fact, promote legal discrimination on the basis of blah, blah, blah. Supports or opposes any labor organization or any action by, on behalf of, or against any labor organization. Isn't that an interesting inclusion there? E supports or opposes the nomination of an election of a candidate for public office, the investigation, prosecution, or recall of a public official, or the passage of a levy or bond issue. Of course, they do that as well. Compensate any employee of the political subdivision for time spent activity to influence the outcome of an election for any of the purposes described in Division C1E of this section. Division C2 of this section does not prohibit the use of public funds to compensate an employee of a political subdivision for attending a public meeting to present information about the political subdivision's finances, activities, and governmental actions in a manner that is not designated or designed to influence the outcome of an election or the passage of a levy or bond issue, even though the election levy or bond issue is discussed or debated at the meeting. And of course, they do that as well. This brings us to those independent agencies of the United States government, even though there are in fact independent agencies of every so-called phony government that we have today, all the state ones, all the subdivisions of that, etc. they all have their own independent agencies in which they can traffic things through it in an endless maze of which each entity is responsible for essentially its own record keeping and thus all sorts of things get lost through different uh, no standardization and paperwork um, all these other things this is what the system's designed for but the overall purpose is to seize stockpile ammunition and weapons that can then be used against the populace in this overall operation so Wikipedia states in the United States government, independent agencies are agencies that exist outside the federal executive departments, those headed by cabinet secretary and the executive office of the president. This is going to get a little bit confusing. In a narrower sense, the term refers only to those independent agencies that, while considered part of the executive branch, have regulatory or rulemaking authority that are insulated from presidential control, usually because the president's power to dismiss the agency head or a member is limited. There's going to be some interesting ones on here. Established through separate statutes passed by Congress, each respective statutory grant of authority defines the goals of the agency 
must work towards as well as what substantive areas, if any, of which it may have the power of rulemaking these agency rules or regulations when enforced have the power of federal law. Now, of course, they're doing all this stuff under the color of law and giving themselves all of these nice, heavy sounding titles and names to what they're doing. But they are foreign enemies. They're enemies, not just acting off of being on behalf of directives from domestic enemies, but foreign enemy interests. That's very important. Of course, they're also contrary to the U.S. Constitution. Examples of independent agencies, we have Amtrak, National Railroad Passenger Corporation, is a passenger railroad service that provides intercity service throughout the contiguous United States and parts of Canada. The Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, gathers foreign intelligence and provides national security assessments to policymakers in the United States. It acts as primary human intelligence provider for the federal government is one of the principal members of the intelligence community, which is overseen by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, ODNI, which is itself an independent agency. Independent, meaning can do whatever it wants. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, CSB, investigates industrial and chemical accidents and safety hazards. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFTC, regulates commodity futures and option markets in the United States. The agency protects market participants against manipulation, abuse of trade practices, and fraud. So, of course, they are the only ones that can do those, and nobody else can. The fraud, trade, abuse of trade practices, and manipulation, as we see more plainly now today than ever. Through oversight and regulation, the CFTC enables the markets to serve better their important functions in the U.S. economy, providing a mechanism for price discovery and means of offsetting price risk. There it is. <laughs> The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is responsible for consumer protection in the financial sector. Its jurisdiction includes banks, credit unions, security firms, payday lenders, mortgage servicing operations, foreclosure relief services, debt collectors, other financial companies in the United States. And, of course, it should be noted that jurisdiction means spoken oath. But that word is used so often incorrectly, just like the word illegal, because they are coding their language. The Election Assistance Commission, EAC, was formed in 2002 to serve as a national clearinghouse and resource of information regarding election administration. It is charged with administering payments to states and developing guidance to meet the Help America Vote Act requirements, adopting voluntary voting system guidelines and accrediting voting system test laboratories and certified in voting equipment. It is also charged with developing and maintaining national mail voter registration forms. That, of course, mail voter registration form is one of their primary components, as well as the National Registry firearms of where to go and seize things. Now, the National Registry, which I didn't cover because I didn't want to <laughs> for the length of this video, most know what that is, and it really relates to the seizure of production manufacturing and whatnot, the National Firearms Registry doesn't have so much to do, even though it is listing all the firearms that are purchased by individuals, but mainly it has to do with the seizure from the businesses. Also, we have the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board is one of the smaller executive branch agencies with just over 100 employees that established to administer the Thrift Savings Plan, which provides federal employees the opportunity to save for additional retirement security. Federal Trade Commission, the General Services Administration. That's the one that was listed on the forfeiture. General Services Administration is responsible for the purchase, supply, operation, maintenance of federal property, buildings, and equipment, and for the sale of surplus items, like forfeited firearms. GSA also manages federal motor vehicle fleet and oversees remote work centers and civilian child care centers. Hmm. We have arms trafficking and we have child trafficking. And, of course, naturally, they also oversees the motor vehicle fleet. That's important. And, naturally, this entity is just a front where most of these, the facade of federal administration is actually coming from a more local level and a criminal conspiracy of, of fraud, right, uh, attorneys mainly, who are forging documents and doing a bunch of other heinous acts on behalf of foreign enemy operations. So here with former agencies, considering that this 
seizure and forfeiture has been going on at least since 1950, but I guarantee earlier. Well, a lot of these former agencies would have had stockpiles that were then moved somewhere else. There's, it's very difficult to know exactly how many stockpiles of seized ammunition and firearms really are out there. The Committee on Public Information was an agency created to influence U.S. public opinion regarding American participation in World War I, lasting from April 14, 1917 to June 3, 30, 1919. It was directed by George Creel. The agency used propaganda available to achieve its goal. The Interstate Commerce Commission, notice that ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, like the International Code Council, regulated common carriers and was thus able to render far-reaching orders such as the desig desegregation of public transportation after trucking and railroads were largely deregulated. The ICC was replaced with Independent Surface Transportation Board with remaining functions transferred to the Department of Transportation. Yeah, trucking and railroads were largely deregulated. Hmm, what could that mean? And of course the rest of these aren't entirely important, but they are all entities that would have had stockpiles of weapons provided to them through the whatever the general service administration or whatever it was because they had a way to do this before and they changed the names and moved it but the general operation is still going on for stockpiling of arms here we have the agencies outside of the executive branch which there's four here and we have proposed independent agencies these proposed agencies are interesting you have the Federal Elections Agency, which merged the roles of Federal Election Commission and Election Assistance Commission, expand enforcement against election interference, and gather election data. And of course, those are phony elections, so this is another front and cover for their foreign enemy operations. Weather Modification Operations and Research Board, proposed by Kay Bailey Hutchinson to promote research into weather modification. Hmm sounds like harp or cloud seeding or chemtrails all that stuff and then we have the nuclear waste administration proposed by blah 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 to provide permanent disposal of spent nuclear fuel and high level radioactive waste and that would naturally be dumped into farmland like they're doing with the solar powered solar farms that are designed for environmental destruction so to carry out this plan, once they have, of course, the stockpile of firearms, which they do in many places, they have to carry out the operation and gain minions, which will then be forced, right, because they, they always try to force everything to carry out the actual physical component of, quote unquote, enforcement of this attack. So the first mechanism that I mentioned for the rise of um, a, a enforcement component of minions would be through the construction of so-called low-income housing projects. Now with these projects of under vast uh, construction across the entire continent basically of the United States the rental contracts will contain highly criminal components, prohibitions, but they will also probably most likely have certain stipulations in them that require in order for the available use of free housing for the tenant to carry out certain operations or be involved in certain groups that will require them to carry out certain operations. These will be very criminally organized rental schemes which will take advantage of a planned crisis in which a large number of displaced workers won't have the funds to subsist and thus they will be offered the option of free housing but they have to sign these draconian contracts which will require them to essentially enforce the international enemy operation on U.S. soil to make a front line, as it were. Now, interestingly enough, in a Articles of Incorporation, 
from the Summit County Greater Akron Community Action Council, Community Action Council, City of Akron, Summit County in Ohio, we basically get the overt declaration of exactly what I'm saying in this video. One, to foster, promote, initiate, and coordinate planning services and development and demonstration efforts for the mobilization and utilization of public and private resources in the Summit County area, including but not limited to the several municipalities, political subdivision, boards of education, governmental and private agencies, and voluntary citizen groups and associations for coordinated remedial attack upon an alleviation of conditions of poverty affecting the peoples of the areas described, serving and doing so in an exclusively charitable and educational capacity within the meaning of the provisions of the Eternal Revenue Code of 1954, including but not limited to the provisions thereof relating to exempt organizations. Now, of course, the Internal Revenue Code of 1954 is the one that was replaced by the 1986, both which have the sections that revolve around forfeiture or acquisition of firearms and ammunition for stockpiling purposes in order to carry out exactly what it says here, an attack. And, of course, it's listed in vague manner because they're not going to come out and directly say, we are going to attack the entire populace of the continent on behalf of you know switzerland the un etc two to stimulate and encourage the initiation formation and provision of any services projects programs assistance and other activities toward the creation and development of employment and economic opportunities the improvement of human performance and work individual and group motivation productivity and the bettering of conditions under which people live learn and work that of course has to do with acquiring the foot soldiers Three, to solicit, contract for, receive, administer, and disperse any funds, grants, appropriations, devices, bequests, and other resources for the execution, implementation, and administration of general or specific programs, proje projects, or activities, including the administration and operation of its own management and activities and carrying out its purposes for the progress included therein. This would be an entity, of course, that would have its own stockpile of arms to provide minions or with which to provide its minions. Four, to do any and all lawful acts and to engage in any and all lawful activities, either alone or in conjunction or cooperation with other persons, agencies, governmental authorities, institutions, and organizations as may be necessary or appropriate in furthering one or more such purposes. And of course, we do see this a lot where this state all laws. You can't actually do all laws because there's a variety of laws that are contrary to each other. What they mean, of course, is acting under the color of law. Any law that is required to carry out this operation. The foregoing statement of corporate purposes shall be construed as a statement of both purpose and powers, and not as restricting or limiting in any way the general powers of this corporation or their exercise and enjoyment as they are expressly or impliedly. Yikes granted by the laws of the state of Ohio and further shall also be construed with particular reference to, but not limited to participation under the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 as amended, provided, however, that the facilities and activities of the corporation shall at no time be used for political purposes, nor shall the net assets of the corporation ever inure to the benefit of any trustee, employee, or other individual having a personal or private interest in the corporation except for reasonable salaries or compensation or services actually rendered, and no part of the funds of this corporation shall ever be used to carry on propaganda or otherwise influence legislation, and this corporation shall not participate in any political campaign on behalf of the candidate for political office or political party. In the event of dissolution of this corporation, any residual funds or assets on hand at said time shall be paid over and refunded to such governmental subdivision or public or private educational or charitable agency as shall be appropriate to the purpose of this corporation, as shall be determined by its board. That would, of course, relate to assets and ammunition and firearms stockpiling. And here it lists out the persons, uh, additional trustees, etc. And this was signed in June of 19. So here, as relates to the construction, the rampant and wide construction of housing projects, mostly which are empty today, 
and remain empty, but they continue to build more. And the planned leading the response to their crisis is the motive. Columbus, Ohio. This is from the uh, so phony Ohio government website. Ohio Governor Mark Mike DeWine, Lieutenant Governor John Husted, and Ohio Department of Development Director Lydia Michalik. Nice title there. Today announced nearly $29.5 million in awards to help improve housing access to Ohio. Talking heads for you. Funding is part of the first round of the Welcome Ohio program which is investing a total of $100 million in grants over two years to help land banks purchase, rehabilitate, or build qualifying residential properties for income-eligible Ohioans. An additional $50 million of non-refundable tax credits is available to land banks and eligible developers for rehab and new construction projects once a property is sold. The need for safe and affordable housing is a national challenge that requires proactive solutions, meaning investments. Strong collaboration across all levels of government said Governor DeWine. This program represents an innovative and forward-thinking approach that addresses the barriers many Ohioans face when trying to buy a home. Of course, it has absolutely nothing to do with actually purchasing the home. It has entirely to do with leading the response to a crisis. Here in a different document, um, we get uh, more information about Akron, the city of Akron in Ohio and their specific operations and plans to carry out this, essentially, an attack. It's not an attack in the same way that one would think of, of an assaulting force, right? We're trained to think of an attack as a conventional invasion of mechanized troops, say, tanks and uh, other types of uh you know, an attack, right? They come in and they start attacking people and killing them, right? That's not exactly how this attack's going to go. This attack is just like the other ones. It's first of type attack in which they, over time and through all these different me mechanisms, set up stronger illegitimate control in which they can entirely and completely erase any type of, of domestic sovereignty or independence that might have been had and entirely implement overt foreign dominance and the attack will mainly be on those so-called low-income groups because it all has to do with income the income of something of value incoming right not necessarily money and that has to do with the return on investment for the foreign interest here it states the executive summary february 2017 the city of akron released Planning to Grow Akron, the City Housing Strategy. The plan included a review of Akron's existing housing supply programs, demand, conditions, and strategies. Supply, right? Recommendations in the plan are intended to reverse the trend of Akron's declining population and facilitate new investment in the city. Hmm. Utilization of the Summit County Land Bank. Summit County Land Bank serves as an agent of the county for the reclamation, rehabilitation, and reutilization of vacant, abandoned, taxed, foreclosed, of course it would be those fraudulent taxes for you, or other real property within Summit County. Other real property. Let's leave it open right there at the end. Since its creation in 2012, the Land Bank has participated in community reinvestment and economic development efforts in Akron and the balance of Summit County with an overall goal of revitalizing neighborhoods, stabilizing property values, reducing blight, returning property to productive use, and improving the quality of life in our community. Of course, that stabilizing property values entirely has to do with the overall operation of having property outside the ability for acquisitions of normal people because the price of the market is so far inflated and it's not going to go down until these people either win or lose. That's the only way it will happen. They either have to win, which that would be a bad world to live in, or they have to lose in which essentially there will be no more facade of the corp uh, corporate government. The city intends to increase efforts to engage the land bank as an active partner in assembling vacant parcels of dilapidated structures, redeveloping housing, and developing strategic plans for unused parcels. For the success of many of the strategies and goals set forth in the Planning to Grow Akron 2.0 plan, 
The land bank must engage, be engaged and open to collaboration with the city. The city and land bank should explore the ability to further partnerships with area community development corporations, CDCs. Hmm. That's an interesting, right? We have ICC and we have CDC, Center for Disease Control or Community Developed Corporations. Naturally, when they have the same names as so many other entities, it makes it harder to find those entities, sort of insulating them against research and investigation to facilitate the re rehabilitation of vacant homes. Additionally, the city, some accounting, and the land bank and others should collaborate to examine the programs and roles of other land banks within the state and region to identify best practices for neighborhood stabilization and revitalization. All this coded language and lack of radical coherence is very tedious to read through. Lastly, given that the city and land bank both acquire and demolish vacant and blighted properties, they should work together to develop a strategic approach to their collective acquisition of buildable parcels and the targeting of properties for demolition. Targeting of properties for demolition. A software system is now in place that allows people to view and propose purchasing city-owned land and the land bank-owned properties. This software system is web-based and available to the public. Of course, it is available to certain members of the public. And they will, of course, choose who those members of the public that can uh, purchase them. And I guarantee most will be foreign. Obviously, behind a facade of local control, naturally. Similar efforts should be developed to leverage what the city hopes to become an increasingly collaborative effort between the two organizations and other partners. Development and support of CDCs and CHDOs, community development or corporations and community housing development organizations are important entities instrumental in neighborhood revitalization. These organizations generally work within specific neighborhoods. In 2018, the city began funding CDCs up to 100,000 in annual support for beneficial projects. Partnering with community development corporations will be beneficial in meeting the needs of the neighborhoods through facilitating neighborhood planning, housing rehabilita rehabilitation, and new housing construction. In partnership with philanthropy, the city of Akron is undertaking community development review facilitated by Joel Ratner. The review seeks to build capacity and leverage existing resources. That last, just like with all of these, the last sentence is usually the most important. Just like it says, leverage existing resources. Develop proactive citywide code enforcement recommendations. In an effort to reduce nuisance conditions and property violations in all neighborhoods, city ordinances should be reviewed to ensure that they address code deficiencies and that code standards and requirements are updated and Legislation should be put in place to put more effective address out of town investors who own blighted properties in the city and continuously violate the city's code enforcement standards. Those codes, property of the International Code Council, are listed on a document by said code enforcement officer in a different area under the International Property Maintenance Code, as I mentioned in a previous video. Ordinances related to the city's rental registry program must be reevaluated despite the Department of Neighborhood Assistance best efforts. Many of Akron's rental properties still go unregistered. Different penalties for noncompliance may be necessary. These people are not constitutional, legitimate governance, right? They are not working in the best interest of the people. And it's very clear from the way they decree and dictate they too, and they see themselves in a contrary position to the populace and the people there, right? Everything is about forcing compliance to what they do. That is not somebody who is afraid of being voted out of office. That is somebody who is an enemy agent carrying an operation out against the people in the area, not working with the people in the area. So lastly, with this document, explore, participate, or explore participating, that's written by, well, typical type of culprit, in the Summit County, for, uh, County Affordable Housing Trust Fund. With reduced federal funding and limited local funds, the city needs alternative revenue streams to move neighborhoods forward. Now, isn't that interesting? Here it states they have reduced federal funding and limited local funds. So they have to generate revenue to carry out their operation. The city needs to cult cultivate philanthropy and private investment to address housing, both new housing construction and rehabilitation. Where do you think that private investment 
good come from. Hmm. This will require working with area foundations and businesses to establish neighborhood endowment. Summit County has established an affordable housing trust fund, working with area foundations, institutions, businesses, benefactors, and philanthropists that will be operated by the Western Reserve Community Fund. The need for a housing trust fund was also covered in the original planning to grow Akron report. The housing trust fund could provide gap financing to developers to facilitate new home construction or grants and loans to support housing rehabilitation. It could also be used to facilitate new construction through removal of blight and to develop partnerships with local developers and community development corporations to facilitate the purchasing, rehabilitation, and resale of blighted properties. The city contributed to the housing trust fund would need to be determined. This could include the city general fund, CDBG funds, property tax revenues and recording fees, tax increment, financing, special assessments from demolition and or real estate transfer taxes. This isn't just about money laundering. This also has to do with funding their operations in a manner that they can hide what they're really doing. For far too long, the city of Akron has been tackling the revitalization of neighborhoods solely with increasingly scarce federal funds obtained from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. A robust housing trust fund would widen revenue streams for housing revitalization efforts. It all has to do with the foreign investment interests and return on their investment. So we get more tedious documentation that essentially forms the corroborative evidence and declares exactly what their operations are intended to do as far as the foreign attack on us. Here it states, the Journal of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Volume 8, Issue 1, 2011, Article 3, Social Vulnerability Index for Disaster Management. Abstract. Social vulnerability refers to the socioeconomic and demographic factors that affect the resilience of community. Studies have shown that in disaster events, the socially vulnerable are more likely to be adversely affected. They are less likely to recover and more likely to die. That's a nice line there. Effectively, addressing social vulnerability decrease, decreases both human suffering and the economic loss related to providing social services and public assistance ever, after disaster. Now, notice in that line, it has nothing to do with saving lives. It has to do with decreasing human suffering, like when you put down a suffering animal that's wounded. And, of course, the economic loss related to providing social services that's damaging the bottom line of the foreign investors. This paper describes the development of a social vulnerability index. From 15 census variables at the census tract level for use in emergency management, it also examines the potential value of the SVI by exploring the impact of Hurricane Katrina on local populations. Introduction. For most of the 20th century, disaster management focused on the physical world, emphasizing infrastructure and technology. The concept of social vulnerability within disaster management context was introduced in the 1970s when researchers recognized that vulnerability also involves socioeconomic factors that affect community resiliency. resilience. This paper describes the development of social vulnerability index SVI for use in disaster management and examines its potential value by exploring the impact of Hurricane Katrina on local populations for illustration. Of course, Hurricane Katrina was one of their lovely events that they organized and orchestrated and was essentially a success for their operations, whereas other disaster events that didn't give them as much ability uh, to, well, it was mainly an experiment to see how effective the current, currently planned operation would be. Background and rationale. All regions of the United States have experienced disasters, both natural and anthropogenic. The hazards that precipitate these disasters will continue to occur in the future. Hazards may be large scales, such as hurricanes, forest fires, and earthquakes, or they may be relatively localized in extent, such as tornadoes, mudslides, or chemical spills. Okay, well, how about a quote-unquote economic disaster? How about that? Although hazard events may be relatively benign, they may also culminate in disaster, severe physical injuries, emotional distress, loss of life, and substantial property damage. The point of destroying entire communities. In both the short and long term, future disasters can have devastating economic health and social consequences for affected areas and their inhabitants. Those, of course, are their important things Econo economy, right? Return on investment, health equity, return on investment in health, and social consequences. 
social having to do with the control factor. Summary and future strategies for the SBI. And this document is a lot longer and much larger like all the others, but I attempt to highlight the sections that are important to keep this video from becoming really long. State, local, and tribal agencies are most knowledgeable about the people in their communities. The Social Vulnerability Index is designed to aid them in their efforts to ensure the safety and well-being of their residents. Yeah, ensured safety. The components of the SBI can assist state and local personnel concerned with all phases of the disaster cycle, uh, leading the response to the crisis, in other words. Knowing the location of the socially vulnerable communities, planners can more effectively target and support community-based efforts to mitigate and prepare for disaster events. Yeah, they have this, this, this operational coded language throughout all of these, right? Attack, target, isolate, die, remove, etc. Responders can plan more efficient evacuation of those people who might need transportation or special assistance. Who might need transportation or special assistance. Such as those without vehicles, the elderly, or residents who do not speak English well. That nice. Go after the easy pickings first, and then move on to the harder, more uh, resistant ones. Local governments can identify the neighborhoods that may need additional human services and support. The recovery phase or is mitigating measure to prevent the need for the costs associated with post-response support. Yeah, mitigation of cost. That means mitigation of their cost, not, of course, the mitigation of cost of life, etc. You know, people dying. Because as they stated earlier, that's going to be a consequence. The Katrina case study illustrated how the SBI can be used as part of this risk equation in the response to recovery phases. The elderly were particularly vulnerable during this event. Moreover, areas that are slower to recover include those that were heavily flooded and those with socioeconomically vulnerable populations, so low income, right? Future case studies will explore how the SBI can be used as part of the equation in the preparedness and mitigation phases to aid in targeting disaster management interventions. And this goes on. A unique toolkit consisting of SBI data along with a simple mapping application was initially distributed to 24 state and local public health departments. Health departments that we know today are particularly vile entities that send around thugs to uh, enforce their nonsense for review and feedback. The toolkit, which is flexible and easy to understand, provides readily accessible data, including the following for each tract or community in the United States. There's an interesting use of the word tract. One, an SVI value for each of the 15 census variables. Two, an SVI value for each of the four overarching domains. Three, an overall SVI of four flags represent percentile rank of 90 or higher for each of the 15 variables for each of the four overarching domains and for the total number of flags for each tract. So here they're, they have overarching domains, they have flags for tracts, and they have, well, they have a bunch of variables, but this boils down, of course, to the so-called low income, the individuals who will not generate revenue as they would like and thus need to be cut for cost effective. So here we get a map, 2021 low income areas, housing gold designated disaster areas, DDAs, counties designated as adversely affected by declared major disaster 2018 through 2020 where individual assistance payments were authorized, authorized by FEMA. And of course on that map you see that it goes up the middle of the eastern half and there's virtually none in the northeastern seaboard or Florida or the giant area of less populated people. And of course, there's a lot recently, according to this document, anyway, in California. So now when it comes to the roadblock element, now that we've established a plan for acquiring the minions and the stockpile of weapons or tools of enforcement, now we're going to look at the particular operational component of the checkpoints or roadblocks. We're going, to, we're going to start with the 2024 construction program, Pendant Engineering District 1, serving Crawford, Erie Forest, Mercer, Vernango, or Venango, and Warren Counties. And of course, we will find similar 
elements and patterns across the entire country. It is not just isolated to these few areas that I'm using as the example. Here, Crawford 2024 construction project, Pennsylvania. We see red highway projects, bridge projects blue, and local projects in green. Now this is located up towards the northwestern portion of the district. And we notice that most of these, these construction projects are centralized in a certain area, but they all focus on access points, such as over here from Route 8 to 77 over to the right. In the middle of the intersection of those two, basically, they've got construction there. And then over towards Canute Lake, you have this main system has a large number of construction. So obviously they can't get everywhere, but they can focus on certain points of access into this district. And that's what we're going to see reflected in the next place that we look at is the focus on access points into district. So they are the local operatives that are implementing this strategy across the board. All right, the next place we're gonna look at is the area towards the top. And we notice the majority of construction is going to be along that border there, the access into not only the state, but the district as well. And here along this, this road that runs, um, runs across it, Route 90, you have a large area of construction and you have a bridge construction at either end. So one end has bridge and the other one is a long stretch of road construction. And then we notice that this makes it essentially square and the majority of these are close to the borders. Not so much going on in the center though. Now there's a lot less here um, in its forest construction projects and this is now towards the inner portion of this section. But we still do see that same pattern where the focus of construction is essentially on the borders of this area. Here under Mercer, of course, naturally, we'll see a lot around the highly populated area, but we also see that same example of access points close to the border, essentially a sort of square going on here. And this is located towards the, the western, bottom western half or southwestern portion of the district. Here, it's really obvious down through the middle where this would be a relay from District 1 into uh, it would appear to be District 10. And in order to cross through here, you would have all of these construction points here, which all would be very easy to transition into control points. And we see a lot with the diversion of traffic and the congestion that's caused by that exactly how effective these control measures really are, especially when people comply with them. Now, the next part that we're going to look at is Nebraska. And this is a, another district, right? A subdivision. And here we notice that we have access points down in the bottom left corner in which you have essentially every passageway from that point into this district under construction. Over towards the east or the right side of this map, we have a, a, a square essentially of construction points. Um, when this area looks to be maybe a little bit more difficult to control access. And then actually along Route 80, you have a lot, but then up towards the top, the singular access road has something like three construction projects going on there and then another one down towards where it intersects off route 77.